Polar molecules have regions of positive and negative charge, which give them physical properties such as high melting point and solubility in water. In this lesson, we will learn how to use the Vesper molecular geometries to determine whether a molecule is polar or not. I showed this flowchart at the beginning of the chapter to demonstrate how we use the Lewis structure to determine whether a molecule is polar like water or nonpolar like oil. Last lesson, we learned valence shell electron pair repulsion or VSEPR, which predicts the shapes of molecules. In this lesson, we will use molecular shape along with what we learned in section 8.4 about bond polarity to determine whether an entire molecule is polar or not. This helps predict the properties of the molecule, like its boiling point and its solubility. Recall that two atoms form a polar covalent bond because... <clears throat> Recall that two atoms form a covalent bond because both atoms need the extra electron to fill up their valence shell. When one of the atoms wants the electron more strongly than the other atom does, it forms a polar covalent bond. This means that the more electronegative atom will have a slightly negative charge, and the other atom will have a slightly positive charge. It is customary to draw a dipole arrow from the positive to the negative end of the molecule. We also saw that the differences in electronegativity determine whether a bond is polar or nonpolar. In this lesson, we will go beyond the polar bonds of section 8.4 and ask a larger question. Is the whole molecule polar? To illustrate this process, we'll explore two examples, water and carbon dioxide. There are four general steps we'll follow for each example, starting with turning the Lewis structure into a 3D shape then determining whether any polar covalent bonds cancel out or add together. In order to determine molecular polarity, you need to be a master of the Lewis structures. Since the first step will always be draw a Lewis structure. The Lewis structure for water is probably familiar to you at this point. Don't forget the lone pairs on oxygen. The X notation for water is AX2E2, which corresponds to a bent geometry. Another way to determine this molecule's geometry is to recognize that it is connected to four different regions of electron density. Being connected to four things gives it the electronic geometry of tetrahedral. And when we replace two of those things with lone pairs, we are left with a molecular geometry that is bent. Now we consult our element electronegativities to determine whether the OH bond is polar or not. The difference in electronegativity is 1.4, which is actually quite large. And the OH bond is certainly polar. In fact, it's one of the most common polar covalent bonds we will encounter. I drew dipole arrows on each polar covalent bond. And the last question we need to ask is whether the polar bonds cancel out. While at first it would seem like they do, we can't answer this question using the Lewis structure alone. We have to imagine the 3D shape of the water molecule. When we consider water's bent geometry and draw the dipole arrows along the polar bonds, we see that indeed they do not cancel out. Therefore, water is a polar molecule. To determine the net dipole of the molecule, we combine the dipoles of each individual polar bond. For those of you familiar with linear algebra, this step is the same as vector addition. To add two vectors together, you connect the tail of one to the head of the other. Then draw a vector that goes from the start to the finish. Placing that dipole on top of our original water molecule, we see that the polarity points from in between the hydrogens toward the oxygen. We can also indicate this polarity with lowercase delta signs showing partial charge. Now we'll run through the same series of steps for the carbon dioxide molecule. As always, your Lewis structure fundamentals need to be strong to answer these kinds of questions. Here's the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. Its geometry is AX2E0, 
making it a linear molecule. We'll next compare the electronegativities of carbon and oxygen to determine whether the CO bond is polar or not. The difference between the two values is one, so the bond is a polar bond. I'll draw dipole arrows on each bond. Remember, before we can say whether the bonds cancel out, we need to consider the 3D structure of carbon dioxide. Lucky for us, the carbon dioxide molecule is linear. So this Lewis structure is an accurate representation of the molecule. Dropping the dipoles on top of the molecule, we see that they point in opposite directions with the exact same strength. These polar bonds cancel out and carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. All right, time to practice this yourself. Is carbon difluoride dichloride a polar molecule? I've already drawn the Lewis structure to get you started. After obtaining the Lewis structure, we need to determine the molecule's geometry. In this case, it's AX4E0, or tetrahedral. Consulting our table of electronegativities, we see that the carbon-fluorine bond is polar, and the carbon-chlorine bond is uh, slightly polar. It's right on the edge. It's much less polar than the carbon-fluorine bond. When I draw the dipole arrows, I'll make the ones along the chlorine bond smaller to indicate that they are less strong than the polarities along the carbon-fluorine bonds. Now we'll ask the question, do these polar bonds cancel out? At first, it appears that they do, but again, we need to consult the 3D structure to know for sure. Here's the 3D structure of the CF2Cl2 molecule. My first question is, wait, are these really the same molecule? It looks like we have two chlorines on the same side for the 3D structure, and yet the Lewis structure has the chlorines on opposite sides. In fact, they are the same molecule. When we write the Lewis structure of a tetrahedral molecule, writing two atoms opposite each other, as we do on the left representation, is the same as writing them next to each other as we did on the right representation. This image shows a 3D molecule rotated by 100 degrees between the left picture and the right picture. You can see that depending upon the perspective, it looks like the green atoms are either on the same side or on opposite sides. Now that we're convinced that these two are the same molecule, we can add in our bond dipoles. We see that the polar bonds do not completely cancel out and CF2Cl2 is a polar molecule. If we draw the net dipole, it points in between the two fluorine atoms. Here's the last practice problem. Is sulfur dioxide a polar molecule? Of course, the first step is drawing a valid Lewis structure. When we do, we see that the central atom makes two bonds and has one lone pair. This is AX2E1, which corresponds to a bent geometry. Next, we consult the element electronegativities to identify any polar bonds. Sulfur and oxygen have a difference in electronegativity of one, so they make a polar covalent bond. We'll indicate that both of these bonds are polar by drawing some bond dipoles. These bonds do not cancel out, so SO2 is a polar molecule. To find the net dipole, we need to use vector addition. Some people find it helpful to think of two tractors pulling on a stump when they think of vector addition. Even if one tractor is going forward and to the left, while the other tractor is going forward and to the right, the stump will feel a net pull in the forward direction. <laughs> 